Hello, thanks for joining us today for our live Q&A with ITP specialists to recognize the end of ITP Awareness Month and Global ITP Awareness Week. I'm Caroline Cruz, President and CEO of the Platelet Disorder Support Association. And joining me is my good friend and colleague, Mervyn Morgan. Mervyn? Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mervyn Morgan. As you can see on the screen, I'm the CEO of the ITP Support Association here in the UK and Ireland. Um, it's a pleasure to actually be with you today. And thank you uh, to PDSA and Jeff Cooper for actually organizing this webinar. Just like to introduce uh, two experts today. We have firstly, Dr. James Bissell from Cornell University in the USA. And we've also, and James is also a medical advisor for the PDSA. And in addition, we got Dr. Vicky McDonald. Uh, Dr. McDonald is also a medical advisor for the ITP Support Association. And she's also the director of the Adult ITP Registry and the uh, Pregnancy ITP Registry at Royal London Hospital. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. Caroline, do you want to? Sure. So the way this is going to work is at, uh, over the next 60 minutes or so, we'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible. And what you need to do is actually put your questions in the chat function there. And then uh, Mervyn and I will go back and forth and we'll have Dr. McDonald and Dr. Bussell answer those questions. Um, and while we're waiting for the questions, um, Mervyn and I uh, are happy to share with everyone that um, back in 2016, uh, our two organizations co-founded the International ITP Alliance and the website globalitp.org. And we've grown that organization to 32 patient associations from 27 countries. And so we've been so amazed and pleased to see the activity from the uh, various associations around the world over the past uh, week and the past month or so. Um, so we're, we're excited the way that uh, we're being able to raise awareness and educate ITP patients around the world. Thank you very much, Caroline. And uh, I'm sure, um, hopefully, you know, people would have seen on social media, especially during the last week, there's been some fantastic work going on from uh, fellow ITP associations. I just, you know, want to shout out um, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Australia, uh, Holland, there's been some brilliant work going on. Please check out the uh, social media channels for these ITP organizations. Now, if I kick off, I've just got one question that is peculiarly uh, sort of resonant to what's happening at the moment in the UK and Europe. Uh, we have in the UK and Europe what the media are calling a cost of living crisis. Uh, due to potentially or very, they are very high energy bills that people are facing. And people at the moment are now quite worried about with the winter coming up, do they have their heating on, etc. Can they afford their heating? And one of the ITP patients have, has actually asked the question, um, if people are reluctant to put their heating on, would those with ITP be more susceptible to other health problems if the house isn't adequately heated? Probably not a question for James, but uh, Vicky, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's really tricky for patients. I, I, so I think yeah, on balance, if, if, I mean, if somebody gets unwell, colds, flus, we know that that can make can make their ITP worse, but not always. Um, I think patients who are on medicines that might affect the immune system, we might be worried about them developing more severe versions of infections. I think for the vast majority, on balance, it probably won't make a massive amount of difference, but I think for a small group, it might. And I think if you're worried about that, I would speak to your haematologist. Difficult to know what access the different people have got on this particular group. Mm. But certainly if it was one of my patients, I would be saying, pick up the phone to me, let's talk through it or talk, you know, phone, phone on a specialist we can go through. Because it's a little bit case by case basis, depending on 
the background of their ITP, their general medical condition, other things they may be suffering from, and in particular, whether they're on medicines that might, might affect the immune system and therefore to affect a response to other infections. Okay, Mervyn, can I add something? Just uh, yes, you can, uh, please. Yes, we think of ITP as an IgG antibody mediated disease, but if they have IgM antibodies, which we know some patients do, though we're not very good at studying which ones, those may be a little more active in colder temperatures. So there's a possibility that certain people, but as Vicky said, a very small fraction would be disadvantaged on their ITP independent of infection. But I think you'd have to sort that out to see what's happening. Thank you, so we, we have a COVID question from Marsha, and I know Mervyn, uh, both the ITP Support Association and PDSA have been providing updates on COVID and ITP patients gosh, over the course of the last two, two and a half years already. So this is on Evasheld and Paxlovid, which I don't even know if both of those medications are available in the UK, but Marsha wants to know, Dr. Bussell, is Evasheld and Paxlovid safe for ITP patients? And what is the best treatment for ITP patients if they get COVID? As far as I know, both are safe for ITP patients, though I don't think there is like tons of data to say, oh, you know, 100 patients received them and had no problems. Paxlovid in particular has a number of medication exclusions, but I don't think they, that affects most of the ITP medications that anybody might be taking. And finally, um, Evusheld is a prophylactic medicine where you would take it before you get infected to prevent getting infected. Paxlovid is actually a treatment that you take when you're infected to short circuit the disease and prevent it from being as severe. So if you actually had COVID, you would want to take Paxlovid. If you, for example, were about to get rituximab or were on other immunosuppressive medication, you might want to get a dose of Evusheld. I would point out that while antibodies last for a certain amount of time, Evusheld lasts for twice as long as usual because it's been engineered to interact with something called FCRN, which is what recycles antibodies and puts them back in circulation. And by having a higher affinity for that, get gets recycled more efficiently, so it lasts longer than regular um, IgG. Excuse me, IgG antibodies and can and is only needed once every six months. Thank That's great that. uh, knowledge there, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> uh, really good detail. I think might be learning something myself. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether you have a programme. One of the things I was going to just say is in the United Kingdom, we do have a programme for patients who are deemed to potentially be at more risk of severe of at increased risk of more severe COVID infection, um, such that if they test positive for COVID, um, they are directed towards what's called COVID medicine delivery units and then are offered a choice of different options, as Jim said, of the kind of Paxlovid and medicines in that group to reduce the risk of severe COVID. And we have had a few of our patients who have been eligible for that. And I mean, I realize it's small numbers, um, but not run into any problems and successfully um, had COVID without too many severe complications. So um, I would think it isn't a reason not to have these medicines if you have ITP and arguably if, if you're on medicines that might, might suppress the immune system and increase the risk of more severe COVID, they're probably a good thing to take uh, to avoid the more severe manifestations. I don't know whether you have a similar program in the States, Jim? I would have to ask Caroline. I think it's just very easily available, very easily available. And actually, uh, my wife was on a call because with um, with um, some of the officials in the government and many other treaters because of her work in immunodeficiency. This was about a month or two ago, and they actually thought it wasn't getting used as much as it could be. So I think it's actually very easily available, both of those, if you need it. Yeah, I heard the same thing. 
Um, so we have a series of questions from Lloyd about his 20 year old son. So I'll try to go through these and summarize them as, as easily as possible. But it sounds like um, he's only had ITP for about six months. He's tried a number of therapies, including uh, dexamethasone. He currently isn't under treatment as his platelets fluctuate between 30 and 200,000, um, and he's not a bleeder. So is a splenectomy really necessary for a 20-year-old if he fails other uh, therapies? Vicki, can I take first crack at that since he's in Florida? And then yeah, uh, I was going to <laughs> let you go first. Yeah. So first off, in principle, if his counts are consistently over thirty, which is what it sounds like, I'm not sure he needs much of any therapy. Second, if without treatment his counts are going up and down, he may have what we would call cyclic or cyclical thrombocytopenia and not necessarily true ITP. Um, uh, there's a hematopathologist at Stanford, Jim Zender, who has published some interesting work recently in blood advances about the pathophysiology of that. And um, if Lloyd or, who, or his son could arrange to send blood to Jim, he could look at and see what, if anything, is underlying that because that may, if he did need some treatment or if there were some consequences of this to him, um, could initiate uh, treatment that might be more specific and more directed, to use a catchphrase, targeted. But that's, that's what I think. I often don't think he needs any treatment um, that I, that's obvious from what Lloyd wrote so far. Yeah, I mean, I think um, obviously it's difficult without all of the info in front, but as a broad rule of thumb, as Jim said, platelets of 30 are satisfactory for most things. The only thing is if he's young and he's at college and he's doing lots of sport, there might be periods where you'd want the platelet near, platelet count nearer 50 if it was contact sports, maybe slightly higher. Um, but certainly in the UK, and I was, there's caveats because everybody has slightly different approaches, but in the UK, we wouldn't be going to early splenectomy for a young patient. That's not necessary, you know, but there are different ways of managing ITP. I'm not saying our way is always right, but generally speaking, we don't do very many splenectomies for patients in the United Kingdom. They can be transformational for some patients who don't need any treatment afterwards. Um, but as a broad rule of thumb, we generally use the medical options before a surgical option like a splenectomy um, for younger patients as well. One thing to add in the subsequent questions when I was reading the chat, there was something about his having used dexamethasone, I thought. So that might confuse things if these platelets are from dexamethasone and there was a question about an infection raising the count and so on. I, I guess the best thing would be to try not to do additional treatment since if I counted right, he's received at least three cycles of dex. And if that's correct, then the chances that more cycles would really be helpful, I think is less likely based on the Italian work from a decade ago. So I would just, oh, only two cycles. So if he wanted to receive one more cycle, he could, but in principle, after that, I would just wait and see what's going on, and hopefully he wouldn't really need anything going forward. The only reason to give him a third cycle, if he was responding and doing well after the first two, is it might increase his chance of cure, because I think one of the drawbacks of dexamethasone use is you respond well, let's say, to one cycle, platelets go up and people tend to say, well, you don't need any more. And then if you relapse a month later or your count falls again, you've wasted an opportunity to really have a more lasting effect. But that's somewhat hypothetical and not well documented. Okay, okay. Uh, should I uh, do another question, Caroline? Yeah, uh, one from in the chat from Karen. Uh, this is actually very applicable as well in the UK. Uh, what is the latest evidence about ITP and COVID? Specifically, what is known about the latest US booster? And why I say it's also evident for the UK, because we're actually 
that they're starting to roll out the booster program now in uh, all of the UK. So, and people are actually asking the, um, the uh, association this same question. Um, is there any evidence, you know, the latest evidence about ITP and COVID and the new booster jabs that are coming out? Shall I go for uh, Vicky first and then James? Yep, so uh, we've had patients relapse ITP after COVID. I think um, one doesn't want to suffer from the consequences of COVID or long COVID potentially. Uh, with regards to vaccine, um, the uh, kind of the review of our data at the Royal London, we've just finished uh, the kind of second wave of analysing it. And we have very low race, relapse rates in pre-existing ITP patients. Um, and I think uh, Mervyn found similar when he um, did a, a snapshot audit of the ITP Support Association uh, patient group. Um, and we're in the process of looking at the wider data. Um, most of the patients in the UK would be getting an mRNA based vaccine and probably on balance have to be slightly careful about you know, being held to account for, for these things but generally speaking I think the feeling is probably as a slightly lower risk of, of immune complications more broadly after the mRNA um, than um, AstraZeneca but it's it's not the, the difference isn't actually hugely significant um, so on a balance our recommendation is to be protected particularly if you were on medicines that lower um, your immune system function. Okay, James? Um, with your help and Adrian's help, as you probably know, about a year ago, we had published a relatively large amount of data on the effects of vaccines, specifically on ITP patients. With Andrew Lee at our center and Marina Beltrami Marrero, we were just in the process of submitting uh, longer term data, including boosters. And what we find, not with the fifth, you know, most recent Omicron booster, but with the previous boosters of the mRNA vaccines, it didn't seem that much happened. There were people who had low platelets, who had ITP, who had low platelets temporarily after the booster. It was interesting because some patients who had had a lowering of their platelet count with, say, dose one or dose two, sailed through dose three and dose four. And other patients who, let's say, had a low platelet count with dose one, also had it with dose two and dose three. So it seemed about 50-50 in our hands, if you had had a lowering, that it would lower again. But in none of these cases at least led to serious bleeding, and none of them were the ones like we had reported in the de novo cases in people who had never had ITP before. None of them had not responded well to treatment, and almost all of them had come back to normal. And I think Caroline and Jen Ramos' work with the PDSA registry would support that as well. So in principle, I would say, and Vicky brought up a very good point about long COVID, we would encourage continued immunization as is appropriate for that particular person and monitor the count after. And if it does fall, because there were people whose count fell for the first time after a booster, not very many, but a few, um, then they could be treated if necessary, or at least watch to make sure nothing happened. And I think, Jim, you make a good point there about distinguishing between those who perhaps have had ITP triggered specifically by the vaccine first time round and patients who had pre-existing ITP and were vaccinated. So when we looked at our pre-existing ITP vaccinated, of which we've got just under 200 that we looked at, um, it was single figure. I mean, I think it's about 3% have had a lowering of platelet count that required therapy, um, by which generally we meant a platelet count of less than 30. And all of those responded. We've, we've not, none of those patients have been left with challenging ITP afterwards, failure to respond to treatment. Um, they've all just needed a bit of support for a short period of time and things have got better. 
So I and you know I think I, I think that is replicated. I think you know we're replicating what you found. So, um, but that is probably subtly different from those who've had very troublesome ITP following the vaccine. I think that is a slightly different group, and I think we're still understanding how those patients may respond down the line. And that is a, a closer risk benefit analysis on how refractory the ITP was, how many lines of treatment, how many complications, and a more nuanced discussion with your hematologist. I think. Would you agree? Yeah. Uh, the only thing I would say is there's a number of studies and they range from what you quoted as 3% as high as 12%. So it's not quite, let's say, rare or very uncommon, but it certainly seems to be transient even when it happens. So I agree in general with everything you said. So there are a couple of questions here in the chat about uh, the TIPO agents. One is uh, from Karen my doctor keeps my end plate dose the same if my platelets are between 50,000 and 250,000. Why doesn't he increase the dose to keep the platelets at a higher base level? Dr. Bustal, I'll let you take that one. Um, well, first, in the we worry that TIPO agents can contribute to a tendency to thrombosis, which may occur in ITP patients anyway. So I think it was very clear out of the studies, particularly of romaplastin or N-plate, but also with l or Promacta, um, that we would try <coughs> not to normalize the count. If there was data that, for example, normalizing the count or making it higher was more curative, that might be a reason to do that. But in principle, it's pretty international consensus at the moment. And Vicki, you can tell me if I've misrepresented the UK in that, that um, it's not a good idea to have the platelet count be too high unless there's some real special reason. I would say in the most recent studies of what can you do to reduce the TPO agents, one with l trombopag that I think was Nikki Cooper's taper study. And I don't know, Vicki, if you were in that or not. And um, the Romaplastin study from France called the Stopago study, it seemed that people did better if they were on a dose that kept their count over 100. But in the 50 to 250 range, it definitely would not go above that. So ideally, you'd be on a dose, if that's what you were looking for, cure or being able to discontinue a TPO agent, you would do better to have a count if you could say 100 to 150 in order to then after several months, try to taper off. But that's based on very preliminary data and has not been thoroughly substantiated yet. Yeah, I agree, Jim. I, what I couldn't quite work out from the question was whether the platelets fluctuate with a steady state dose such that they are anywhere between 50 and 250. Because if that's the case, it can be very difficult if you then start to tweak the dose at the lower platelet count, you end up overshooting even more at the higher platelet count. And so sometimes you have to accept that there is a range within which the platelets sit um, and keep the dose steady to avoid even bigger swings and fluctuations, which can increase the risk at both ends of either the more kind of uh, thrombotic issues or bleeding when you then have to stop because the platelets are super high. So um, it, sometimes it's a pragmatic accepting that there is a range and you have to kind of leave it there to keep the patient safe. I think that's a great point. And I, if it's okay, Vicki, let me just echo it for one minute. Um, I think the biggest mistake that happens in general with dosing TPO agents, other than maybe diet with l is changing the dose too quickly. And so I think keeping the dose stable for a period and seeing what happens, even if the count bounces up and down a little, as long as it's in a safe range, it's better. And if the count gets very high, personally, I wouldn't recommend stopping it. I would do like give a few days of aspirin or something like that rather than stopping it just to avoid the crash that you alluded to. But I think that's a great point. So just to, to follow up uh, for both of you, when you talk about keeping the dose uh, steady or stable, I just took a call from a patient this past week um, her uh, platelets range from about 30,000 to, uh, to 100,000 on end plate, but her hematologist has her go in for a CBC weekly 
and adjusts her dose based on her platelet count. So it sounds like that's really not the correct uh, approach or protocol for end plate. Vicki? So I think I am sure it's done with the best intentions as far as kind of keeping a close eye and, um, you know, not wanting things to move too far. But but generally, I think that isn't, you know, up front, yes, weekly platelet counts are fine. But I think that then becomes a big burden on the patient. It generates a lot of anxiety. And if you've got a flavour that actually the platelet counts aren't out of range either way, and we've certainly got some patients who do swing, but the, whichever TPO they are, TPO RA they're on, it avoids bleeding. And we really cut back and give them that freedom and a bit of reassurance and avoid that driving the plate because because it's natural to feel anxious when you're waiting for a result and it's natural to generate a kind of a degree of oh my goodness what's it going to be this week and oh it's changed and now I've got to do this and I I think there is a time for for keeping a close eye at the beginning for sure or a period of instant sudden onset instability for sure but the rest of the time if there is a bit of, there's always going to be fluctuations even in patients without ITP you can check somebody's platelet count a week apart and it can be quite different so um, I would try and cut back it, you know I think Sometimes it, it usually is done with the best of intentions, but actually can generate quite a lot of burden. So I would support what you were advising, Caroline, and just saying maybe just step back slightly and give the patient a bit of a break. Yeah, I, I think it may happen a little more with romaplastin because it's a weekly dose. So it has an effect and then the effect can fade. But uh, I 100% agree. I mean, let's not get let's not go crazy with the counts as long as they're in an OK range. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question here from a lady called uh, Marie. She actually emailed this in. Um, her daughter's got ATP and she recently turned 10. She's now also been told that she has celiac disease. Um, her onset of puberty could be sooner than others. This obviously concerns uh, Maria in terms of her daughter's ITP and and uh, her daughter's uh, periods uh, with the onset of puberty. What, if anything, should we expect? Should she still have ITP at the time of starting her periods? Vicky, could I take a shot at that? Yeah. Um, one of the things I think that, I mean, celiac is another autoimmune disease. If it's real celiac as opposed to somebody who's sensitive to gluten but doesn't have celiac disease that's linked to an hla marker an immune marker called b27 i believe but i might have the number wrong so that's not automatically linked to itp but can occur together the real issue i think is regarding puberty Sometimes people get better at puberty and sometimes people get worse at puberty and sometimes they don't change. So before worrying about would the periods be really heavy, I would worry a little more about how will the ITP change, but it might well get better anyway with the passage of time. And she didn't say anything about does her daughter need treatment or what else is happening or does her daughter bleed? At least I I'm not looking at the chat, Mervyn. So if you tried to make it easier on us and left out some stuff I apologize to Marie but that's what I think Vicky yep so I would agree with um, everything you said Jim as far as a practical support for the period side of things is this do you know if this patient's in the UK Mervyn? she is in the UK yes. yeah. yeah so um on a practical level if the ITP is still an issue when she hits her periods um, and men are key um if the periods are heavy, there's some very simple measures, such as, particularly if she's got celiac, making sure her iron levels are really good, uh, making sure her vitamin levels generally are very good, uh, that she's got a healthy, balanced diet. If the patient, if the platelets are over 50, in all probability, broadly speaking, she's unlikely to have too many major issues that are driven related to heavy periods from the ITP. I think if the platelets are lower than that, that might be the case. And if she's really struggling, then I think um, being referred to a an ITP centre, most of those will have some link with a, a, a gynaecology clinic. Uh, 
Um, and certainly we would, where we are, we have a, a gynecologist who does a clinic alongside a haematologist for not just for acquired disorders like ITP, but for inherited as well. So I think there is a support. I think Jim's quite right. It's difficult to know how girls will go. And unlike with inherited disorders, where you're very clear how that, you know, how they're bleeding disorder behaves it is a bit different for ITP so it is a bit of a learning curve and for those poor girls it comes at a time when they're also going through quite a lot of turmoil mm -hmm. so it can be quite challenging um, and I would encourage the mum to have those conversations if she can with her daughter sooner rather than later um, but also perhaps encourage discussion with the haematologist slash paediatrician and and there are there is infrastructure in place certainly in the UK through some of the bigger ITP centres. Well, one, one more point. If Let's imagine, as Vicky said, we have a situation where she's having heavy menstrual bleeding. One approach could be to just figure out a way to raise the platelet count if that's easier to do exactly what Vicky said, make sure it's over, say, 50, so there's not a lot of problems. But if she needs to do something for the periods, I think it's important to realize that progesterone-based hormonal treatment is far better than estrogen-based hormonal treatment because estrogen might make the platelets and the ITP worse and progesterone might make the platelets and the ITP better. And then in addition, tranexamic acid is another possibility. So there are a lot of options and I think that supports strongly what Vicky said about looping in a gynecologist in addition to a hematologist. Right. Thank you very much, both. Thank yeah. You. Hey, Marvin, can I just jump in here? We, yeah. I, I wanted to mention we recently heard from a young woman uh, in her late 20s. She just got married and she and her husband um, are thinking about starting a family. And she was diagnosed with ITP in college. And so she's been on birth control for the past five or six years. And she just wrote to tell us that she went off birth control and her platelet count went up after having low counts for five or six years. So to your point, Jim, are there certain birth control, uh, you know, estrogen or progesterone, which you're mentioning that can have a negative impact on the platelet count? Well, there's a lot of evidence that estrogen is bad for autoimmune disease. For example, in adults, lupus, which is a very broad autoimmune disease, is nine times as frequent in women as men. And we know that women of childbearing age have two to three times as frequent ITP as men. And there's a ton of in vivo, uh, in vitro lab studies showing that it's bad. What most people don't know is there are three studies, two of which are small, one of which is unpublished, but involved 40 some patients, um, looking at progesterone as a treatment of ITP. And it's not a brilliant treatment, but it's definitely an effective treatment. So that's why I think in certain settings and you want to avoid estrogen and use progesterone. Yep, I agree okay. with him. Thank you very much. Caroline, you got another question? Uh, sure. So we have uh, we have some other, let's see. Lloyd is asking about his son who has been treated for ITP with prednisone, IVIG, two DEX pulses over the last six months. And he said that his son seems to have been getting sick more frequently. He had COVID, flu, and now a cold. And he's been living in dorms during the entire time. But obviously, some of these drugs uh, suppress your immune system. So could that possibly be the reason he seems to be getting uh, sicker more often? Vicky, Vicky, I'll turn that over to you. Vicky, do you want to? Yeah, so um, I, it's likely multifactorial. I mean, it, you, I think he's a in dorms so presumably there's a lot of people around b i think the the kind of natural rhythm of the various viruses in in the community has been disrupted by covid and isolation measures and people are you know, that kind of cycle of things all coming at the same time is a challenge and i think potentially yes if you are on uh, steroids repeatedly 
uh, there is an increased risk of um, infection um, and feeling more symptomatic. I think it's a risk balance because if your platelets are really low and there's a risk of bleeding, sometimes you can't get around that. Um, but as Jim was saying, and we were talking earlier about frequent doses and courses of steroids, I think if we're getting, if he's getting into the kind of six months and had to have repeated doses, then thinking about things that support the platelet count if it drops below 30 is our general rule that perhaps aren't immunosuppressing or aren't steroids might be the next step to think about. Um, so I don't think that the clinicians have done anything that wouldn't have been done elsewhere, but I think, yes, you're probably in the round. It's all of those three things together that are contributing to him getting lots of germs. I agree. Okay, we've got one from Phyllis. Uh, she says she's leaving for a trip to Italy. 16 days and she's concerned about keeping her platelet count up in a safe range it's currently at 91 uh, she takes promacta 75 milligrams once a week and she also takes uh, 1000 milligrams of cell set twice a day uh, is there an adjustment to dosage recommended or other drugs that she should be taking as a prevention uh, she'll be in the country painting and would want to avoid any blood tests while she's abroad. I think she needs a personal physician to accompany her uh, on this trip. And maybe Vicky and I could flip a coin to see which one of us gets the honor. But um, I, I don't, I mean, it sounds like the count is great. It sounds like she's been on those medications for a while, so it seems like she's tolerating them well. Um, anybody who travels, if you wanted to have some prednisone, let's say, and maybe some uh, antacids, um, just in case something goes wrong, so you have a way to rescue yourself and a way to protect your stomach under stress, if you are rescuing yourself could even take some antifibrinolytics with you but for somebody with a count of 91 that's a lot of insurance that she may or may not need but if she'd feel more comfortable she could do that alternatively depending where in Italy she's going I'm sure Vicky or I could uh, put her in touch with somebody who's reasonably close to her that she could at least contact and get advice from Yep, I would, I would echo Jim. I mean, I think, you know, I totally understand the anxiety and you want to go and have your break and do your painting and enjoy it. And if you were my patient, I would be saying, go and have your break and enjoy it. And yes, just if you, depending on where you live, whether your states or other, I mean, either of us could point you in the direction of some biggish centres in Italy, but I would say, go and have a holiday, enjoy it, treat yourself, enjoy your painting and don't stress too much about it at all. There's also a fantastic ITP support group in Italy, so we could put the patient in touch with Barbara, who runs the organization yeah. there as well, and she has a world-renowned hematologist on her medical advisory board, as Mervyn and I both do on our board, so I'm happy to help out any way we can. That's a great um, idea, I think, Caroline. Yeah. If, yep. if she was anxious enough, it would probably not be terrible to give her those three medicines to carry with her just because it might help her to know nothing's going to happen but in the one percent of the time she's all set and she won't have to go crazy go to an er screw up her trip etc um so john has a question about immature platelet fraction can someone comment on effectiveness of imf immature platelet fraction to determine whether your ITP is due to a production problem or destruction. My hematologist has tested me, but I've heard nothing about IMF from PDSA. So first I'll just comment on that. Um, if you go to the PDSA website and you go to the search bar and you put in immature platelet fraction, you'll see multiple studies that'll pop up. Um, of course, uh, you know, I don't know about in the UK, Mervyn, I'm sure you guys have published studies on this as well, but yeah, Dr. Yeah, Bussell, yes, writes many of uh, our articles for our quarterly newsletter and our monthly e-newsletter where we've had a number of studies on immature platelet fraction. So uh, with that, Dr. Bussell, I'll turn the question over to you. 
Well, some of the best studies um, were done, and I'm embarrassed to say that I'm blocking on his last name, worked with Carol Briggs. His first name is Sam, was at UCL, and he Machin. did one, huh? Machin, that's right, M-A-C-H-I-N. He did some really good early studies on that. I think the jury is still not is still a little out on if you can use it diagnostically. If the IPF is low, and he called it, I guess, IMF, but I think it's immature platelet fraction, so IPF. Um, I think the jury's out on whether that's diagnostic or not. Um, so I'm not sure that's a test you should go to to say, do I have ITP or not, if that's what it's trying to determine. Um, there is a thought that if you're IPF, if you do have IPF, ITP, and your new platelet fraction, your IPF is low, that you may respond less well to TPO agents, but that's not yet conclusive. And it depends on how low and what's the normal threshold and so on. So I think it's a very interesting test. We've done a lot with it, um, but I'm not sure you, how you can use it in a one-person clinical setting. Vicki, you may have more updated info on this. No, I think I would echo that. I think you're right in that um, it is a, a potentially interesting tool, but really it's of academic interest, I think, at the moment. It's trying as a wider group to understand what it means. Um, yes, you know, higher, like you said, a lower IPF, well, does it or doesn't, do, do those patients respond or not to certain agents or not? But I think there isn't that much literature. Um, I as far as the initial question was around also whether this is or isn't ITP I mean I think it can be helpful to see whether it's increased platelet turnover as a cause of a low platelet count or the marrow isn't working properly with other things coming into play but that's a very different question from managing ITP specifically um, so it, we do measure it but it doesn't, it's really to get more of an idea on a patient to patient basis and pull that together as a group. We don't really use it to guide our therapy at all at this moment in time, because I don't think it's sophisticated enough and I don't think we understand it enough yet. Okay, um, another COVID question. This one's from Lisa. Um, and it is a question that was coming up numerous times over the last two and a half years. It's air meetings. Um, are there any COVID treatment recommendations for people who've had a uh, splenectomy and whose ITP is in remission, but who, who are also at risk of severe infection because they haven't a spleen? Uh, Vicky, do you want to go with this? Or? I was going to say, Jim, do you want to go first on that one? And I can. Okay. Sure. Um... So the biggest thing we know about overwhelming infection after splenectomy, as, as far as I, I know, is that so-called encapsulated bacteria, uh, pneumococcus, H. flu, meningococcus, are ones that you're at risk for because you don't have quite the same degree of apposition of a bacteria to phagocytes when you don't have a spleen. In general, the way we try to minimize that from being a problem is to give vaccinations. Now, it's very clear that you ideally would give those three vaccinations or vaccinations for those three agents, ideally at least two weeks before splenectomy and while not on a very immunosuppressive treatment. But once you give the vaccinations, exactly how often to repeat them and what the criteria are, are not very clear. You could certainly just automatically repeat them every five, seven, or 10 years. Alternatively, it's not that hard with a blood test to measure levels of antibodies to those agents. And if the levels are lower than would be ideal to then get re-immunized. Now, there are patients who may be, as part of the underlying reason they have ITP, um, or any other consideration don't or didn't respond that well to vaccination. And that's an issue. And in addition to repeat vaccinations, 
possibly they would benefit from daily antibiotics. That is what we do in kids uh, when they're at a very young age. And there's some debate about whether everybody should have it or not. So, um, Vicki, before I turn it over to you, because I'm sure you'll have something to add, um, I would say that over the past few years, we've also become aware that people who have undergone splenectomy long term continue to be at risk for having too much clotting, a stroke, a clot in the leg, a pulmonary embolus, something like that. So if you're thinking about what's going on in your life after splenectomy, successful or not, you should factor that in. So if you're going to have a procedure, maybe you would need anticoagulation at that time or at any of the other times, like a prolonged plane flight and so on, to prevent you from having more than one risk coalesce with, an, you know, one risk coalesce with another risk and give you a greater chance of having problems. Vicki? Yeah, so um, the uh, patients who've had a splenectomy were considered a higher risk of infection. I, from our, my experience, I'm not sure it's as high a risk of severe COVID than being on immunosuppressive medicines. Um, I think we don't understand what antibody levels mean when we've been checking the anti-spike antibodies after vaccination and we'll hopefully understand it better soon. Um, so, but I generally feel that it's better to err on the side of caution. And I think if you've had a splenectomy, you get COVID, um, it is worth getting in touch with your medical professional to say, do you, what do you think about me having something to avoid getting severe COVID like the antivirals we were talking at the beginning? Um, and certainly would encourage vaccination um, because some protection is better than no protection. Um, and yes, I echo your, your info about uh, pre and post splenectomy issues. Uh, there is a, a very real risk of, uh, albeit small, but it's still significant risk of uh, thrombosis after splenectomy. Um, gen single figure-ish percentages, but it's still there, at both arterial and venous. And that is important to think about as you get older. And also important to think about if you get COVID and you're immobile and all the other things. So I think all of, for all of those, reasons if you've had a splenectomy I would do what I can to avoid getting the more severe versions of COVID or, or other infections for that matter. If um, I wasn't maybe I missed it I wasn't clear that that was a COVID related question um, I agree with Vicky that COVID does not seem to partic particularly be worse in that setting I think the comment about thrombosis after splenectomy and with COVID and maybe being immobile is very opposite for what we're talking about. But, um, I, you know, if somebody wanted to take Paxlovid, if only so they had less fever and less worry that they were getting a secondary bacterial infection, that would be great. So okay. here's my follow-up question to the two of you about splenectomy. Why is it in the UK that after a patient, an ITP patient has a splenectomy, that they take prophylactic antibi uh, antibiotics for life, but in the US, we don't? Vicki? <laughs> uh, that question comes up a lot, Vicki, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> really good yeah. answer. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think we are cautious. And um, it's a good question. I don't know that I have a really good answer for other than I think we prefer to err on the side of caution. And I think also for patients who have other vascular risk factors, uh, similarly, we would be also recommending a baby aspirin uh, earlier um, to avoid kind of art particularly arterial coronary and uh, stroke events. So, yeah, I mean, I it's such a simple thing to do. I appreciate there are resistance issues and other, but um, you know, to avoid that overwhelming, very straight, something that's very straightforward to avoid the overwhelming sepsis element, um, then generally speaking, that is what we do. There are some patients who don't want to take it and I think we don't get too hung up on that, but as a broad rule of thumb, it's what, what we do and have done. And we're creatures of habit in the UK. It's, you know, kind of, I guess you, a bit like the splenectomy there are in some countries people are much more fond of a splenectomy earlier than we are um and you end up 
following guidelines and standard pathways, I think. But I, I'm not sure there's an absolute. I'm not sure I would be upset if someone said they weren't going to take it. I, I think one thing I would say is, as Vicky said in the beginning set of answers, it's so infrequent that it's hard to demonstrate that anything you're doing actually makes a difference. So you're doing it based on pathophysiology and what you think the risk is. I do think it's funny that this is something that a country that I think of medically as more nihilistic than we are is the one who's now professing caution and taking medication. But um, it, it's hard to argue about this. I, I would say I forgot to mention there's data that uh, vaccination post splenectomy is not 100 percent. It's like it's not nearly what it should be. So but I don't think those people would be the ones who are likely to be taking antibiotics every day for life either. OK, thank you very much. I've uh, got a question from Sue. Um, she mentions a um, shingles bar uh, vaccine called Testava, which was discontinued due to adverse effects. She says, what are the chances that this vaccine for shingles could have caused her ITP? And would you recommend, or her husband's ITP, would you recommend a spleen removal for a 71 year old male who's received an M-plate on a weekly basis, but his count is at 14? So um, the I don't know about the um, shingles vaccine. We don't routinely do shingles vaccines in the UK. It's a special request only. Um, so we don't see it very often. Um, as far as splenectomy, there is good evidence uh, repeated from several studies that splenectomies are less effective long term when you have them done when you're older so I'm not sure I would be recommending a splenectomy and we do do it very very okay but very very rarely um most of the time it would be other medical options because there's a clear distinction between those under 65 and those over 65 on response rates and those over 65 don't respond as well to a splenectomy but obviously with the caveat that we don't do we, we're not you know it's not top of our list of therapies anywhere in the UK but but there's clear evidence you don't do as well if you're older with a splenectomy yeah, I agree. There's lots of um, there's lots of information missing here, you know, about the rest of her husband's history and um, what dose of end plate he's on. I would say that some people think, and I'm not sure I'm one of them, but the people who do think it are people who I think very highly of that a very low dose of daily prednisone might help the end plate if there's a reason not to increase that dose. So maybe five or even at most for a short while, 10 milligrams a day of prednisone might bring the count up. And then maybe if it was 10, you could taper down to five and so on. Or dual therapy with others. It's a good, very good point, actually, Jim. Thank you. I didn't think to mention that. But yeah, dual therapy with other medicines can also be effective. Um, the, the, you know, something that like something that modifies the immune system as well as the TPORA for patients who have quite challenging ITP can be quite effective combination. And we do understand that for a group of patients with ITP, there are a group of patients who definitely need more than a single therapy to keep them stable. In fact, we've some of the patients have asked questions on here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would do all of those things before thinking about taking a spleen out, particularly in somebody who's older. And the, the one other thing we could think about, and I suspect you'll agree, Vicky, but feel free to say if you don't, um, it does seem that in people, let's say, over the age of 65, if you have ITP, so we haven't discussed whether this gentleman's had a bone marrow or any kind of workup for other conditions, but if you have ITP, it seems in the more elderly patients that um, TPO agents are the best agent. So maybe this would be somebody who would respond better to one of the other TPO agents than Romaplastin. Again, we don't know what the dose is, et cetera. So these are just considerations to maybe let Sue discuss with her hematologist. So we received a follow-up from Phyllis. So it sounds like you've talked her into going to Italy, which is really wonderful. Um, because she wants the <laughs> she wants the contact in, info for Barbara in Italy, which uh Phyllis, I'm happy to send that to you privately, but also for anybody else out there, if you go to the website, go Can we lose Caroline just got on mute. 
Yep, sorry. If you go to globalitp.org, there's actually a patient support page where we list all of the worldwide ITP patient associations, and there's a link to their websites, and there's, uh, and for some of the groups, there's contact information and email addresses we, where you can contact those folks directly. And if you don't see it there, again, you can email me or you can email Mervyn, and we'd be happy to send that yeah. information to you. Um, so here's a follow-up. Um, hello, I'm Nancy, and I want to thank you for all your information. I have maintained platelets of 50,000 to 80,000, but only on Celsept, 200 milligrams, and plate 500, uh, and IVIG, 30 milligrams every two weeks. If I drop any of these meds, I drop to single di digits. It's been one year of this. Should I receive another bone marrow? Um, again, zillions of details and a number of tests would be needed to really answer that question well. I do agree with the concept that this is a lot of treatment for somebody to take. I'm guessing she means 2,000 of CELSEP, not 200, because 200 would be an extremely low dose. Um, but this is a complicated evaluation that I don't feel comfortable just throwing out something, um, you know, willy nilly without having a better sense of what her situation is. If uh, you want to email me or if you want to email Vicki, I'm sure be happy to work more, but it would take a lot of details to really answer that. Vicky? Yes, I think, yeah, it, I suppose it, it would be broad principles, wouldn't it? I guess it's understanding whether there was a marrow at the beginning. Um, I would, as a broad rule, wouldn't necessarily jump into repeating a bone marrow if I hadn't done things like work through other lines of treatment first or there weren't other features in the blood count or other. So I'm, I... I don't think that we, I, I, like Jim, I think it's difficult to say a yes or no. I wouldn't necessarily be panic panicking that you hadn't had one if all of the other things have been looked at, but it is important that the haematologist looking at the blood count, the blood film, you in the round, any other symptoms you might have, what other investigations you've had. Um, and I agree with Jim, I think perhaps a, an offline discussion on more detail or a switch to something else, because that's quite a lot of treatment. And it would be also just saying, well, actually have other agents um, rituximab, switching of the TPORA, as Jim just talked about for the last patient. There's, there's a few other things that I think could, could be done. I mean, that's quite a lot of treatment if it hasn't been done already. Can, can I ask a general question about a bone marrow biopsy? Is it still routine when a patient is initially diagnosed? And if not, at what point would you recommend a patient having a bone marrow biopsy? Yeah, so definitely not routine. And only if there's unusual features, either about the type of presentation about the ITP, things that we might be able to see on the more detailed blood count in the laboratory, other tests that are abnormal. Um, the patient has really unusual symptoms or additional symptoms, weight loss, things that we might be worried about. Um, so very much not a routine, even in the more elderly patients. There's, there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that unless there is something else, um, a bone marrow is a painful and unpleasant procedure and it doesn't add anything to your diagnostic workup. Would you say that still, Jim? We don't do we don't do that many marrows unless there's something unusual about it. I apologize, but I think I would be a little more pro bone marrow than you are. I 100% agree it's not routine, but I think if you have people over 60, there's certainly more of a chance you're going to identify other things. There are ways to try to minimize the pain and the discomfort with doing a bone marrow, especially I think you need an aspirin and a biopsy in general if you're going to do it. But I think it's still an important part of the armamentarium and especially in elderly people. And you know, when you were talking about the previous patient, if she had a bone marrow a year or two or three ago and her course is not different, that's fine. I would lean a little more to doing it than it sounded like you would, but you know, there's not a right or a wrong here. And there are, there will be at least one abstract at ASH this year. 
from a Canadian group identifying a, I think, more than 10% incidence of subsequent malignancy in older patients who have developed, um, who have had ITP and then having them go on to other things. So, uh, I, you know, I think it's a complex thing and I think we need more data and better ability to decide who needs what when. Yeah, I mean, I um, I think I don't disagree with most of what you said, actually, Jim. I suppose for an elderly patient, we would, if there's no other atypical features, um, we'd probably give them a round of treatment first before we wait, went into a marrow. But I think if after the first line of treatment, we weren't winning, then I think we would, you're quite right, you risk stratify early, don't you? But I think upfront at the time of diagnosis, generally speaking, we don't rush as much as we may have done in the past but I, and I think if there are these abstracts of ashen things that would be quite interesting to see because when we did the literature review for the consensus there wasn't huge amounts of info and it, it the consensus sat on the side of not necessarily doing it unless there were other features so it'd be interesting to see that one I hope to be there so I shall come and say hello Jim uh, and have a look at it in person. <laughs> Come to the ITP breakfast Friday morning that Caroline. It'll be in, and... it'll be in my diary. <laughs> I've, I've just got a, a quick question here for, that's come through via email direct to me from uh, Anna Bolding talking about Abitromba pack in the UK and asking a question of have we any idea when it would be licensed by NICE in the UK? Now, I believe I can actually answer this. Um, in Scotland, it is licensed. We managed to get it through the SMC in Scotland probably a year ago now. Um, with regard to NICE in England and Wales, it's now done two committees, and I'm told that it is now awaiting the chairman's decision. So effectively, it could be any time. So that's as far as we know. They, they haven't come out and said we will make an announcement on a certain date. We're just waiting for the chairm chairman of that committee uh, to actually make the uh, uh, decision and uh, uh, go public with the announcement. So I hope that helps, Anne. So Great. Right. Nice answer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and we did lots of work on them committees, trying to get it through lots of presentations. But um, all I'm afraid all people are worried about is the cost factor, when if, if you look at the numbers, it's a no-brainer. So anyway, that's the story for another day. So. Um, is a good question from Sue. Is there any evidence about relative effects on platelet count when switching from l bag to Abitromba bag, or is it entirely about the individual patient? Now, there was lots of information on this as well during the NICE submission, but um, Vicky, do you want to go with that one first? Um, so I, is there evidence? There is some, some, preliminary early evidence to suggest that there is a potential potency difference between avatromopag and eltromopag. Um, there's not lots of information on it yet and there will be a post what's called a post pass study post authorization surveillance study um, which will look at this or at least look at patients who were started on avatromopag either those who are switching or more otherwise so that we can understand it a bit more but there is definitely value in switching if you're not responding to ultra pack, even though they're both small molecules and even though they both generally work in the same way, uh, slightly just subtly differently from romiplostum, there's definitely value in switching um, and a significant percentage of patients will respond to the majority when you switch. Jim, would you agree with that? Um, almost all of it, but um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so recently, Hani Alsemkari published, and I not sure which journal, Blood Advances, American Journal of Heme, British Journal of Heme, something like that, uh, published a switch study with 45 patients. More of them went from romoplastin to avatrombopag than with l to avatrombopag. But there were, I think, about 10 to 15 patients doing the latter, and almost all of them responded. In addition, overall, and I can't distinguish this for romoplastin versus l is what they switched from, 
um, half of the patients, it went from 19 taking steroids with their TPO agent to nine taking steroids. Now, the only thing that's confusing about the study, in my mind, is some of it was just due to convenience. With most of it for romaplostin was they didn't want to have to get a shot every week. And with l trombopag some of it was not wanting to have to observe the dietary precautions of taking it on an empty stomach. But by and large, that study strongly supported abitrombopag. Andrew Lee at our center looked at eight patients who had been on all three agents. And in general, they were on them romaplostin and l or l and romaplostin and then going to abitrombopag. And I think six of the eight responded well in that setting to abitrombopag when the reasons for changing were lack of response. And that was published um, last year. So I think there's pretty good evidence. The only thing I disagree with Vicki about is I think that while romaplostin binds to the TPO receptor where TPO does, and l trombopag and avitrombopag appear to bind to a transmembrane portion of the receptor, the part that's actually in the receptor, in, in the membrane, um, it seems very clear from work from Britta Will and Martha Solovisner and some work from Nikki Cooper and John Porter in London that um, l trombopag an important feature of the response is chelating iron, whereas abitrombopag doesn't do that at all. So while they both bind to the receptor on the same place, I don't think their mechanism of actions are the same. And that's why I think switching may benefit some people. So here's a, here's a quick lightning round uh, of three questions that we get all the time. Is it safe to drink alcohol with a low platelet count? Is it safe to fly if my platelets are below 20,000? And can I get a tattoo if I have ITP? Dr. McDonald, we'll start with you. <laughs> uh, so uh, alcohol, generally, yes. I mean, it's difficult. There's always so many caveats. Don't get super tipsy and fall over and bang your head if your platelets are five. But um, moderate, moderate alcohol and a quality of life is so important. I think beware being on other medicines, beware heavy alcohol, regular heavy alcohol use, stick within the recommended guidelines, um, particularly if you're on thing on medicines that might affect your liver function. Um, but as I don't I don't think it's an absolute contraindication to alcohol. Um, flying, we're relatively relaxed. Um, if even if your platelet count is low, if you're not symptomatic. I think if you've got lots and lots of symptoms and bruising and bleeding, that is different. But if you're not symptomatic and we have a cluster of patients whose platelet counts are low, they have minimal symptoms and we let them travel as long as they've declared it on travel insurance. Tattoos is not so straightforward because I think there is a risk of bleeding and damaging the skin and not getting the outcome you want. So I that is I'm more, more cautious about at low platelet levels. Um, yeah, so I don't know whether Jim will agree with that, but generally okay with caveats, generally okay with caveats not bleeding and not not always recommended depending on what your count is. Yeah, One, two, three. I think that's completely spot on. I, I think not having more than a drink, whatever that is, is probably good because I think there are studies showing that alcohol is not great for the bone marrow aside from the liver. Um, as far as flying, the only thing I would say is if you've ever had nosebleeds in the past, the last thing you want to have is to be on a plane and have a bad nosebleed you can't stop. So if there's any risk there, again, you could take a little tranexamic acid with you to mean that you'd be protected. But as Vicki said, that I've heard very little from patients saying, oh, my goodness, this was a major problem you know, why didn't I think of it ahead of time? So I think it's generally very safe. And tattoos, I'm less sure about, and I'll defer to Vicky's opinion. And you do like your gin and tonics in the UK. So I think we have to be careful of the tonic water as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> also, if that's used for restless legs, which is not an infrequent thing. 
And I see we have a, a follow-up, Mervyn, from Lloyd about the uh, what about marijuana use and effects yeah. on platelets. I, I don't think there's really much data that I'm aware of, but I certainly haven't heard anything negative. I mean, I don't know. Have you heard from patients, Caroline, or Mervyn, or, no, or no. that somebody's written in and said, oh, I smoked marijuana or I ate whatever and got into trouble? Haven't heard about that. Nope. No, me neither. That's good. Okay. Um, one here from Phyllis. Well, she's actually done a couple. Uh, the cost of Promacta going forward. Uh, with the new, new bill that's been passed, will that limit the cost to $2,000 annually? And then she's also said, is it okay to drop Promacta dosage from three times a week, 75 milligrams, to once a week if the platelet count goes over 500? Uh, because my platelet count suddenly dropped to 90, should Promacta be tapered off more slowly? I, I, Vicky, if you don't mind my saying it, I just think from it's again really hard to understand what's going on. Yeah, it on is, a, isn't it? Yeah. Basis, but for sure, if you're tapering any of the TPO agents or most medicines, probably better tapering slowly. You know, don't go from th three times a week to once a week, go from three to twice a week if there's good reason to taper, is what I think. But I don't know, Vicky, you probably have a better answer than I do. Uh, well, it's probably it's actually quite um, difficult, Phyllis, without the backstory, because there, yeah. there isn't always a, a hard and fast rule. And if plate, patients whose platelet counts fluctuate, it, it's a bit of an uh, there's no set formula per se. Um, it's a little bit more of an art form. And actually, without the context of the bits behind, it's probably difficult to say. I mean, I agree with the broad principles of what Jim said generally. Uh, a slower reduction than a sudden slam on the brakes. However, if the plate account is super high, a slam on the brakes might be appropriate for some patients. And it is, it's it's quite nuanced, I think, when we're getting into the realms of very fluctuant counts. I don't know about the cost of Promacto because actually our funding system is very different in the UK. So it's not something that we would necessarily get involved in. The, the only thing I would say about that, just to add a little granularity to it, let's call that, um, if your platelets go to 500, your platelets at a higher level are binding much more of the TPO and the l pag and whatever in the circulation, so there's less going to the marrow. So if you slam on the brakes, you run the risk of going to a really low count very quickly. I share the concern, though it's never been manifest that thrombocytosis with TPO agents has a thrombotic effect, actually. I mean, the it, it, instances of thrombosis do not seem to be related to the TPO, uh, to the platelet count, though maybe a little more on the arterial side. So I would rather do something, like I said, like take a baby aspirin for a few days and see where the count settles out rather than slamming on the brakes or going from three times to one time even if it might be that the count would stay up and then you would go down a little more in a week or two after that. That's a good point. A kind of general, more gradual drop tends to avoid these huge swings, um, which can be quite difficult to manage and a bit distressing for patients. So I think um, we don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, we have some questions in here, I think, that are very specific to each person's ITP case and history and are quite complicated. Um, so we'll just take one or two uh, more questions um, from Marsha. How slowly would you recommend tapering off five milligrams of prednisone? Um, my friend's doctor from Mayo has him tapering off one milligram every three months, but he's been on five milligrams for 15 years. Is that reasonable to taper that slowly? Vicki? I mean, he's, they've been on steroids for a very long time. Um, and there are, it's not just the worry about the ITP when you taper steroids and patients have been on them a long time. There's also... Um, steroids have other effects on the body 
And when you start to bring them back, if you've been on them for years and years, you can start to find, you've got to allow the adrenal glands next to the kidneys to start functioning again, to produce their own cortisol, et cetera, in simplistic terms. Um, so it, it's, I mean, one milligram every three months is quite slow, but actually if they know him, know the patient well or your friend well and have some anxieties about doing it super quickly. The other thing that might be worth doing is that as the steroids get to super low doses is measuring the patient endogenous cortisol and some cortisol responses to see whether they get the steroid withdrawal quite rapidly it's something we're going to look at as a UK wide audit actually is our practice around that because I think it's probably quite variable can be a bit time consuming um, so in a broad principle a slow taper when you've been on something for a very long time is a sensible thing to do partly from the ITP and partly from the kind of pulling back on the phys other physiological effects that steroids have on the body. Uh, I think absolutely. And at five milligrams a day, it's not a huge emergency to get off. If this was 20 milligrams a day, I can't speak for Vicky, but I think we'd want to get it, that person off a little faster if it looked like they could taper. So we've had a, a few folks ask if they could have uh, your email addresses or how can they contact you for follow-up questions. And I would just suggest that you contact PDSA. Um, it's PDSA at PDSA.org. Or Mervyn, where can they contact you and Dr. McDonald? Uh, info at itpsupport.org.uk. And one of the questions that came up was asking about um, new or emerging therapies. And both Mervyn and uh, the ITP Support Association and PDSA had uh, virtual components of our annual conferences and conventions. And I know Mervyn, we both had sessions on new upcoming treatments because there are so many out there. There are so many clinical trials. So. Um, is your con uh, convention platform still accessible and available to patients? Yes, it is. And plus uh, a number of the, the talks, particularly the one you're referring to there by Dr. Drew Provin, uh, they're available on our YouTube channel, which the link is on our website. Yeah, as, mm -hmm. as is PDSA. So you can access yeah. the PDSA conference um through the pdsa website or, or contact us as well and dr david cooter did a, a session on upcoming therapies dr Bussell or dr mcdonald anything that you want to say about new therapies just in general i know we could probably go like another hour just talking about uh new treatments on the horizon vicky i'm gonna let jim i'm gonna let jim go first because he is he's a guru on these newer <laughs> therapies um so i'm gonna let him speak first well, I think both Vicki and I are on the FCRN uh, inhibitor from Argenix, and it's the study that um, came out and was submitted as an abstract to ASH. And what was uh, very exciting is that it's going to be presented in the plenary session at ASH. So it's one of the top six abstracts for the meeting. So that will get a lot of attention for that. And I think it's really exciting that Doug Seams, who's a PDSA medical advisor and a great person and extremely knowledgeable about ITP, will be introducing it. Uh, the BTK inhibitor, Rilzabrutinib, uh, had an article published on its phase three study, I think, in the uh, New England Journal a month or two ago. And Dr. Cooter was the first author on that. And there's definitely a lot of exciting work. We could talk about this for quite a while, but I'm not sure what else to add. Vicki? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it, it, I think it, it is, it's exciting because for many years there weren't many options. And I think the combination of the development of newer therapies alongside the work that various different countries and clinicians are doing to understand a bit more about ITP, to try and risk stratify ITP, to try and understand where best different treatments may be positioned in treatment pathways is is um it makes it quite exciting appreciate that for some patients they're still early in their journey or they've got you know having a tougher time um but i i it's it's great to have these options that are coming that 
offer patients very different ways of trying to manage their autoimmune disease um, and therefore hopefully finding something for everybody eventually that suits or fits or gets them into a nice and stable place. Yeah, I think um, I think the one thing, the things we would really need for the community as a whole, better diagnostic ability to say, oh, Vicki, your patient should take this treatment and your other patient should take that treatment. Being able to identify that in an objective way would be great. And I think we still don't have it. And the other issue would be to have a treatment where if you took it for a while, you would be cured. And there is a, some hope with rituximab and the French have done a nice study and are starting now a randomized study combining rituximab with belumimab, which is an antibody to BAF, which is B cell activation factor. So it's hitting the B cell pathway in two areas and things like that hopefully would be more curative and allow us to say, you know, if you try this, side effects are few, it might be a little inconvenient for a while, but we hope you'd have a good chance of being cured from it. And I, I'm hoping we can approach those areas more as time goes on. Yeah, so thank you, Jim. And, and actually, for those that are in the UK, there are a couple of other studies being run at uh, various sites looking at other mechanisms such as complement inhibition and um, what hopefully will be coming is a BAF um, both for ITP and for those of you who have autoimmune hemolytic anemia with it as well. So um, yeah, I, I, we will keep our the registry website up to date with the various trials, but also we'll keep Merv in, in the loop for those things by Nikki Cooper and the research network. So Thank do you. ask because it's always worth uh, asking us. Vicky, on the other hand, I will have Caroline keeping me up to date. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> and in line, Jim. <laughs> it's a lot of work, I got to tell you. Now, um, if you go to the if you go to globalitp.org website, we do have a list of clinical trials by country. Uh, and I know that on the PDSA website, we also have a list of clinical trials, and those are updated on a monthly basis. And Mervyn, I'm sure you have some information for your, your patients as well. We have the same on our website. There's a link, and you can get all the uh, clinical trials for Europe on there as well. So, yeah. Thanks. Right. Well, I think uh, with that, we should probably wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Bussell and Dr. McDonald for your time. Um, Mervyn, I think this has been a wonderful collaboration between our two countries and our uh, organizations. Um, and we're happy to have everybody join us today and participate in ITP Awareness Month and pump it up for our Sport Purple for Platelets Day. And um, please uh, share your photos with us. Um, We'd be happy to share them with the ITP community at large. Well, okay, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Mervyn. Thank you, Caroline. I think just quickly before Mervyn says anything, I think, you know, we mustn't underestimate the amount of work that you put in to supporting patients. And certainly for me as a clinician, it is great to be able to point patients towards a, a really good, robust well thought through resource for patients and opportunities to discuss, you know, peer to peer as well. Um, I think it's it's fantastic. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, James. So if I can just close and say uh, thank you both. Thank you, Caroline, for organising this. Thank you, Jeff, who's behind the scenes there. Um, as Caroline said, there's lots of information about all of the ITP support associations around the world. If you go to um, globalitp.org, you know, you can get all the details there. Um, you know, we've sort of mentioned some of the many projects that have been going on, especially during Awareness Week, all over Europe, Italy, uh, Holland, the UK. Uh, there's also in uh, South America and USA. There's stuff going on everywhere. Please have a look at, IT, uh, at globalitp.org. And also, if you need anything in the UK, uh, go to itpsupport.org.uk. Thank you very much, everyone, and hope to see you again next year. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.